Hey, good after afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the panel on globalization, corporate accountability, and the courts. My name is Kent Greenfield. I'm from Boston College Law School, uh, and I'll serve as moderator today. A couple of uh, housekeeping reminders. First, if you wouldn't mind to turn off your cell phone, uh, at least turn off the sound of your cell phone. Um, Second, if you, you can get CLE credit for this, uh, for this panel, but in order to do so, you have to go outside and sign up. So if you haven't done that and you expect CLE credit, please do so now. Um, and this panel is about corporations and human rights. Now, sometimes you say that and people go, what? Corporations and human rights? Uh, yet, just yesterday, the United Nations endorsed the uh, recommendations and the new framework by the Special Representative for the Secretary General for Business for Human Rights and Corporations. Uh, so it's an issue that is alive not only at the national level but the international level. And it makes sense. Right? Of the 100 largest economic entities in the world, uh, 48 are countries, 52 are corporations. Wal the Walmart by sales uh, has, is, are greater than Sweden's GDP. General Motors sales is greater than the GDP of Saudi Arabia. ExxonMobil is about the size of Turkey in terms of economic power. So these corporate powerhouses uh, are diverse in w how they make money, their culture, uh, and how th and the, the industry area. And of course, they do make money. They do create wealth. For example, in the United States, corporations are the primary source of private wealth creation. About 60% of our national income uh, flows from the corporate sector. At the same time, corporations are sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, uh, bad actors and can create significant externalities with regard to environmental damage, worker exploitation, partnership with, with dictatorial regimes, in violations of human rights, whether it be Shell in Nigeria, or BP in Colombia, or Unical in Burma. So our panel today is to discuss this area, uh, the area of corporations and human rights. And there are a number of legal and quasi-legal developments that are occurring uh, domestically and, in and internationally that we will talk about today. Uh, and they all relate to the growing realization that, that human rights are not just a matter of for nation states, but for corporations as well. So whether you come to this from the perspective of a poli public policy maker or uh, a, an attorney with corporations as clients or as an activist, this is an area that is relevant and, and important for us to understand. So we're going to focus on a number of things today, uh, including the Alien Tort Claims Act, the over 200-year-old statute that, provide, that offers aliens a venue in federal courts uh, for suits alleging violations of international human rights law. We have an amazing panel to, uh, to introduce these issues and to, to discuss these topics. We will first hear from Professor Jean Woods uh, of Loyola, who is an expert in international law. Then we will hear from Owen Pell, who is a partner at White & Case, who is an active litigator in this area. Then we will hear from Judith Brown Chomsky, who is an attorney, sometimes with the Center for Constitutional Rights, who is famous for an, a number of things, including her leadership in the famous suit against Unical. We will then hear from Paul Bland, senior attorney at Public Justice, who is an active litigator on behalf of the public interest clients around the country. And finally, we will hear from Isaac Nesser, who is a litigator at Quinn Emanuel and knows quite a bit on about the Alien Tort Claims Act and other aspects of this. I'm going, uh, each speaker will have uh, seven minutes or so, and then we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion more broadly. So, Professor Woods. Thank you, Ken. And I'd like to express my appreciation to the American Constitution Society for inviting me here to participate in this panel. I'm really honored to be on a panel with such esteemed um, guests, and I expect to learn a great deal as we um, engage in this conversation, which is really one of the hottest topics in international law and now constitutional law um, that's being debated today. 
We're examining an apparent paradox between increasing global economic integration and the retreat of U.S. courts in cases involving economic actors, U.S.-based corporations, and foreign nationals. This is illustrated in the Second Circuit Kiobel decision holding that corporations are not persons for purposes of the Alien Tort Claims Act. On the other hand, there is the Citizens United case, wherein the Supreme Court declared corporations to have the rights of natural persons for campaign finance purposes. It would appear that global corporations have the rights but not the duties of international persons under recent federal jurisprudence. I would posit that this is indeed not an anomaly, but rather a characteristic feature of contemporary globalization with its unique historic specificities. During a previous global expansion between the 15th and 19th centuries, global corporations also enjoyed such a status. They exercise sovereign prerogatives, such as negotiating treaties with foreign rulers, capturing and administering foreign territory, collecting taxes, coining money, and waging war against indigenous peoples in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Their quasi-sovereign status was not altered until after the Industrial Revolution when the territories they conquered became colonial appendages of European states. I want to refer to the definition of globalization that was provided by the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It defines globalization to include, first, an increasing reliance on the free market and growth in the influence of financial markets and institutions in determining the viability of national policy. And keep this definition in mind when you think about the debates that are ongoing in Congress right now. Second, a diminution of the role of the state and the size of its budget. Third, privatization of various functions previously considered to be the exclusive domain of the state. Fourth, deregulation and a corresponding increase in the role of private non-state actors, in particular transnational corporations. <clears throat> By the late 1990s, it was widely recognized that globalization diminished the authority and control of the territorial state over economic activities conducted by its nationals both abroad and within its own territory. Private corporations are at the forefront of the expansion of the global economy, while states play a supporting role. <clears throat> Private corporations also have at their disposal the resources of a network of powerful multilateral institutions such as the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, a plethora of international investment treaties, and regionally based free trade agreements. Wielding this enormous wealth, power, and institutional support, multilateral corporations are able to deploy a variety of strategies to avoid accountability. Like the chartered companies of the past, today's multinational corporations exercise certain quasi-sovereign authorities, such as the ability to arbitrate on equal footing with states. They are enabled through state law and multinational institutions, multilateral institutions, to exploit and injure not only the peoples of poor countries, but those of the most powerful states as well. For example, a SARCO, a multinational corporation responsible for severe environmental damage in El Paso, Texas, was allowed to declare bankruptcy, and the settlement 
for people injured by its uh, mining operations came to about 1% of what was actually needed. New multilateral institutions like ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, a product of the World Bank, is reminiscent of old colonial mechanisms that stripped host states of jurisdiction over disputes involving foreign nationals. Developing countries are particularly vulnerable, pressured by the global economy to settle disputes with foreign investors through binding arbitration in ICSID. Multinational corporations are even able to access these tribunals by changing nationality. In addition to the humiliating infringement on national sovereignty, the economic consequences can be staggering for small countries. For example, in March 2010, an arbitration panel ruled in favor of Chevron against Ecuador, finding that the domestic courts in Ecuador caused, quote, unreasonable delays in resolving the suits and awarding the company $700 million plus in taxes and costs. So I will stop there and yield to my fellow panelists, and uh, we will come back to these questions in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Owen Pell, um, and what I've been asked to cover briefly is just a, a very brief overview of the Alien Tort Statute, and then <clears throat> a reaction I've had to what I think are other statutes that are arguably displacing the Alien Tort Statute as a means for creating more accountability for multinationals, uh, especially with regard to human rights. Um, for those of you who know this history, I apologize. The, the ATS was passed in 1789 as part of the first Judiciary Act, which generally laid out the jurisdictional limits of the various federal courts. Uh, it has been acknowledged by various courts that its legislative history is neither definitive nor clear. The act is seemingly simple. It says that an alien may sue in a federal court, i.e. without diversity being present, uh, for a tort only committed in violation of the laws of nations or a treaty of the United States. From 1789 to 1980, there were only a handful of alien tort statute cases, and I don't think anyone really paid much attention to it. Starting with the Phil Artiga case in the Second Circuit in 1980, uh, that case, the alien tort statute came to have new life. That case found that causes of action that may not have existed in 1789 but had since developed under international law uh, could, if they had become normative, uh, could allow for causes of action to be brought under the Alien Tort Statute. There were then waves of cases that started to be brought and the causes of action began to evolve. First we saw cases against government officials and officials operating under color of state law or government authority. Then we started seeing uh, cases involving aiding and abetting claims, whether as to individuals or even companies operating under color of state law. Uh, some of the early cases involved companies that provided security to the government or used government for security on projects. And then eventually to aiding and abetting cases that simply had to do with by doing business with a regime, uh, a company caused or furthered violations of human rights. Um, and we saw the courts wrestling, uh, as Professor Woods talked about. There was a real tension because the statute is seemingly simple but not necessarily clear. We saw courts wrestling with how much could a U.S. court draw from rules of decision under common law in the United States and how much did it have to rely on international law with regard to defining the tort that could be the subject of a claim. And so we have seen claims relating to natural resource development, unionization, environmental claims, uh, and claims relating to businesses that, that did business in South Africa at the time of apartheid, including through the sale of consumer products. All have been the subject of alien tort statute claims. Eventually, the Supreme Court in 2004 in the Sosa case, uh, Sosa v. Alvarez McChain, um, brought, arguably brought the era of rapid expansion in alien tort statute claims largely to a halt. The court held that the statute is purely jurisdictional and did not by its terms create causes of action. Uh, the court 
held that the law of nations was not frozen as of 1789, but that in locating causes of action under international law, it, it uh, told the federal courts to be very narrow and very careful, and that the federal courts should not be running to define new causes of action. The analogy the court used, and it really was an imprecise analogy to be fair, was that the cause of action must be as well defined and recognized under international law as a claim for piracy would have been in 1789, uh, which albeit by 1789 the law on piracy was fairly well developed, but it's still a difficult analogy. Um, courts continue to wrestle with what part of a claim can be drawn from U.S. common law versus international law, and I think the, the case that's now drawn everyone's attention, although it's not going to be necessarily a focus of the panel, is the Second Circuit decision in Kiabel, um, where Judge Cabranes, who is a well-known internationalist, has written a bunch of decisions uh, on international law, including the Flores and Yusuf decisions. Um, he tends to take, I guess, what I would call a, a classical view of international law. He definitely takes a narrow view of what international law is. Um, it, definitely resembles what I learned in college back during the 15 and 1600s as opposed to what some might consider a more modern view. Um, he held that modern academic views of developing norms of international law are not evidence of international law. Uh, he has said that in a number of his opinions. He held that the Alien Tort Statute incorporates any limitations arising from customary international law on a claim, including who can be a defendant. And so the crucial ruling in Kiabel was that um, he found that it had not become normative under international law for corporations to generally be actionable for crimes under international law, and therefore it was not part of the cause of action. So he really framed, I think, a lot of what Professor Woods was talking about in that we see in international law a growing number of treaties under which corporations have rights and can assert rights as juridical persons. And yet at the same time, there is a good argument, especially looking at the Rome statute of the International Criminal Court, where there was a provision for aiding and abetting that would have allowed corporate liability, which was then stricken because there was not a unanimity of states who were willing to go along with that provision. There is an argument that generally we don't have a lot of evidence, including with regard to international tribunal rulings, of states routinely holding corporations liable for crimes under international law. So where does that leave us beyond the Alien Tort Statute? Well, I think there are a few statutes worth thinking about when one thinks about other forms of transparency and accountability for major corporations. Um, first of all, there's the FCPA, which I think, especially since the Chiquita case, has taken on a new relevance in the human rights area. I think that there is certainly a willingness on the part of governments to equate terrorism and corruption. And there is certainly a view that corruption can feed into terrorism and its financing. Therefore, given the scope of the FCPA, its broad jurisdiction, and the number of states that now abide by the UN Anti-Corruption <coughs> Convention and that fall and or that fall under the EU uh, uh, provisions on anti-corruption, I think that, um, and the number of companies that are public companies that are subject to this regulatory rubric, I think we're going to start seeing corruption statutes, anti-corruption statutes, become a focus for human rights-related litigation and human rights-related prosecution. Um, another issue that I think is interesting are things like what we're seeing in the Dodd-Frank Act. The fact that we have a provision of Dodd-Frank that provides for reporting by corporations that issue securities on conflict minerals. This is, I mean, it doesn't necessarily lead to lawsuits, but the idea that corporations are being forced to make disclosure uh, is in and of itself a very interesting development and I think could lead to things happening at the state level. U.S. states may start weighing in on disclosures they want from corporations doing business in their states or with a significant stream of commerce, uh, much like the way California tried to weigh in in the Holocaust area with regard to insurance or looted art claims. Um, and lastly, I wonder whether we're going to start seeing claimants attempt to go to the International Law Commission of the U.N get rulings on whether something that a corporation has done violates international law and then use that to frame an ATS claim um, as a way of trying to get around the problem of federal courts wrestling with what is and is not international law. So I think that even though the ATS may have had some cutting back by the Supreme Court in the Sosa case, I think that there's a lot happening 
that puts corporations um, more on guard than they ever have been before with regard to their human rights records and human rights related activities. Thank you. Oh. So can I unsay all of the things that Mr. Pell said? Let's see. I think they expect that. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, with regard to the FCPA, the corruption laws, they don't provide any redress for the victims of the misconduct of the corporations. Yeah, the people go to jail. The victims do not receive a remedy, uh, which is the focus of what we have been trying to do. I brought two of the earliest uh, ATS cases against corporations. One was a Doe v. Unical that had to do with um, cases, uh, the use of slave labor in Burma. <coughs> and the second one was um, Wewa versus Shell, which had to do with um, the relationship between Shell and the military dictatorship in Nigeria. Uh, both cases settled, but the way to them suggests, in part, life after the Kiobel decision. So I, I want to talk a little bit about those cases and then come back to Kiobel. Um, Unical was uh, lost on summary judgment to the defendant. And the defendant and the court dismissed the state law claims. We appealed the, uh, the summary judgment and proceeded in state court. And eventually it was the state court case that uh, was about to go to trial when the case settled. Um, amazingly enough, the vacated Unical decision of the Ninth Circuit is often cited and I still believe is one of the best explanations of what we understood we were doing when we brought the case against Unical. The WeWa case was dismissed uh, at the beginning on two issues. One was personal jurisdiction and the other was forum nonconvenience. The decision of the district court was reversed. First, the court found that Shell does business in New York by virtue of the fact that it had a stockbroker office. You could send to this office in New York and say, okay, um, I want a brochure about Shell. Um, it, it, even though this was a very small part, a minuscule part of Shell's economic activity, the court said it was sufficient that they had an employee, they had an office, they rented Xerox machines, that all of those made Shell present in New York. We also, the court also found that what the district court said, that New York had no interest, the citizens of New York had no interest in a claim by Nigerians against an English company, the court said no. The court said there is a public purpose. That is the affirmation of human rights values. And therefore, there was jurisdiction. There were other pieces of it. The court said, if you look at Shell on one side and the resources of Nigerians on the other, Shell could manage to get its documents to the United States. That was a big thing. They said, oh, how will we ever do that in this modern day? Um, so these two, the, the Shell case had another piece, which is, relevant, and that is that there was a suit against the president of Shell in Nigeria. That way we got jurisdiction over him as he passed through New York. Um, 
And so the case went together, both against the corporation and against its chief officer. And one of the things that may be the fallout from the decision in Kiobel would be that the next lawsuits will be against the officers and possibly the shareholders. I mean, corporations are limited liability entities. They exist to shield the officers and the shareholders. If that's taken away in the area of human rights violations, then they seem a logical next place to bring a lawsuit. So that we don't, we, we do not believe those of us in the human rights bar that even if Kyobel should be the law of the land, it would not mean that there wouldn't be international human rights cases against multinational corporations in state court or against officers in federal court or in federal court under state claims, both of those being possibilities. As to the description of what, what the cases are about, no case, no case survived a motion to dismiss on the theory that just doing business in a country that was a dictatorship was enough. That's not what the current uh, apartheid cases are about. There was no case that got past summary judgment. In each case that passed a motion to dismiss, there was a nexus between what the kind of aid and support that the multinational gave to the wrongdoer and the harm that was suffered by the plaintiffs. And I think that's part of um, normal jurisprudence and appropriately part of ATS litigation. Later, maybe we'll talk more about the Kiobel decision itself. Well, I think I uh, slipped through the um, fine-toothed um, um, screening <laughs> process for this panel because I had noticed a title that dealt with uh, corporate accountability <laughs> and the global market, and I deal a lot of I do a lot of predatory lending cases and a lot of employment discrimination cases where large and multinationals um, cheat or rip off people. And um, I missed that this was going to be uh, really so focused in on the alien tort statute. So when I realized in the first conference call that we talked for an hour and I said nothing, which was uncharacteristic, I um, realized I should print out off of Westlaw a bunch of alien tort statute cases and a bunch of polemical law review articles on both sides. And based upon the extraordinary depth of understanding of the statute that I've developed, I had a couple of um, <laughs> thoughts. Um, the first thing that struck me about this statute is that uh, some of the pathologies that I think you see in some of the really whacked case law that's developed around <laughs> it mirror some of the pathologies in other areas of law that involve corporate accountability. Um, the first thing that jumps to mind is that a majority of the current Supreme Court has a strong inclination to sympathize with corporations in ways that they do not sympathize with individuals. Um, I think this, that this, there's a sort of built-in affinity for the overdog in the Supreme Court that comes out in a variety of settings. Um, and the, this Kiobel case, you look at it saying that, well, you know, if an individual did this, then that would, be, that would be a tort. But if a corporation does it, you know, that's okay, and there's no remedy whatsoever, and you can't sue them. You know, so what is this doing other than incentivizing people and how they're going to structure their operations just before they, you know, go ahead and hire someone to go and kill a bunch of union workers? Um, the, the idea that there was this complete double standard comes out in, in probably the biggest um, case in consumer law of the last 20 years that was decided just a few weeks ago by the U.S. Supreme Court in the uh, AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion case where the Supreme Court said that in a large number of cases, and according to the corporate defendants across me in a bunch of cases, a bunch of payday lenders think in every case ever in which a company sticks into its fine print contract to ban on class actions that they can just exempt themselves from all the consumer protection employment laws. So you look at the Concepcion decision and some of the reasoning in it, and you look at the difference between the way corporations are viewed by this court and individuals. So a number of years ago, when the, when the court was first inventing the idea that civil rights claims could be forced into mandatory pre-dispute arbitration where the company writes an arbitration clause that forces the individual to give up these 
these rights. Um, the plaintiffs came in, the civil rights plaintiffs came in and said, my God, you can't do this because in arbitration there's no meaningful judicial review. If the arbitrator makes gets a decision completely wrong, flatly ignores the law, there's no judicial review whatsoever, you are stuck with it. And Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote this opinion and said, that's outrageous. I am sickened at this. If you know, that goes back to the hostility to arbitration that exists in the 1920s. We can't allow this. Arbitration is a great, a great, wonderful thing. And the idea that, a, that an arbitrator could get something wrong, that's just the price of what Congress intended in 1925 and just shut up. And that was it. You know, civil rights plaintiffs, you know, your, your, your complaints, you know, are outrageous. So in the Concepcion case, this, this, the company is saying, well, my God, we could be forced into arbitration on a class action basis. And Justice Scalia writes, this would be horrible. Imagine a corporation having to defend a case in a class action. What if the arbitrator got it wrong? What if the arbitrator made a mistake? Then you wouldn't have judicial review, and the, and the company could end up paying out a lot of money without being able to have an appeal. How could you do this to a corporation? You know, have you no feelings? And uh, there's this, this, this incredible double standard. You know, if you can do this to an individual, that's fine. God, it's just a crappy individual. But a corporation, oh my god, that's totally different. That's the Second Circuit decision in Kiabel as I read it. Um, another thing that I see in, um, in uh, Kiabel is there's this really selective reverence for history. So there's certain history which we have great reverence for and we give it this enormous weight to. And then there's other elements of legal history that we just throw overboard fairly, fairly easily uh, in, in certain courts. So for example, in the world that I deal in, there's a lot of effort by big companies to shield themselves with contract law from any kinds of liabilities. And the, what they look at is that first there's a reverence for the part of contract law that has the idea that if something is someplace in the fine print, that that signifies assent. And what you have is you have this, you have this model of assent that the Supreme Court takes, which is basically two white men sitting across from each other at a table in which they are selling a cow for a certain amount of money, which we put on the table, and then they'll use their sealing ring and you know, seal it in wax, and everyone understands everything. Which, of course, has nothing whatsoever to do with contracts in the consumer and employment setting now, in which there are these huge fine print documents written in tiny fonts, written in words that regular people don't understand. They're routinely, unilaterally amended by one party in ways that nobody reads and nobody understands. But we act like this assent still is there. So whenever somebody comes in and complains about something in a contract, there's this like, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry, but our history as a people is we give great weight to contracts because everyone is sent to them. So if it's in the fine print, you're stuck with it. There's this other part of contract history, though, which is traditionally we used to have a world of contract law in which states could pass limits to contracts and say certain types of contract provisions are going to violate our public policy, or they are going to be unconscionable, or they're going to be deemed to be just so unfair we aren't going to allow them. And there's a lot of case law like that. And what's happened now is the Supreme Court's sort of gone back and they've thrown all that history overboard and they said, well, you know, um, all of that is contrary to what Congress wanted when they passed the Arbitration Act, or in the ERISA setting you see this, that, oh no, Congress didn't intend for there to be any sorts of limits on what can be in a health plan from a state, so you're finding the preemption, which is wiping away all types of laws. So it's, it's very similar to what um, Professor Wood was talking about when she said you have these entities which have all of these rights, uh, but they're not getting the corresponding course, uh, responsibilities. You're now suddenly having contract law in which the party who writes the contract, which is, n which is always the corporation, right? I mean, everyone here is an individual, you have a cell phone. Anyone want to raise your hand if you wrote your cell phone contract? Okay, I didn't think so. Um, I think that most of the international workers that we're talking about didn't write the contracts either. You know, I think that you will see that these are things that are drafted by the stronger party. But what's happening is you have this enormous reverence for the part of history that says let's give these things some weight and no reverence at all for the part that says there are some limits on them. The last, um, I think, uh, sort of pathology that you see that's coming out of some of these cases involving the alien tort statute involves form nonconvenience. It becomes a cover for a race to the bottom. In other words, corporations can choose the place to operate which will give them the, to have the fewest limitations on them. And if someone tries to bring a case against them in a, in a, in a location in which they're actually going to be a court system would possibly give you a remedy, we're not going to respect that. And what does that remind me of doing the kind of work I do? It reminds me of the way the National Bank Act has been completely rewritten by the Supreme Court. So right now, if you're a national bank, all the national banks in America are, are based in either Delaware, South Dakota, or Utah. Okay? Now, you might think from watching television that there would be banks based perhaps in, say, San Francisco or New York. Not so. All the national banks are in Delaware, South Dakota, or Utah. Why? Because these are jurisdictions with no usury laws and which have the, probably the most miserable consumer protection laws in America. So the idea is that they can then take these terrible, miserable laws and go and stick them on everyone else. 
So if you could live in a jurisdiction which has really great consumer protection laws, but the Supreme Court has said, well, all your consumer protection laws go out the window because instead the bank has decided to base themselves in South Dakota. Now, you don't get to vote for the South Dakota legislatures, uh, legislators, excuse me, who pass these rules that let them do whatever they want, but you get to live with them. So again, you're getting a lot of power without the corresponding responsibility. And I think, I think a lot of this sort of thing, this, a lot of the stuff that you read in this alien tort statute law, which is really troubling, is stuff you see in a lot of other areas where corporations are evading almost all meaningful responsibility. Um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about perhaps not whether these claims ought to be brought, um, but where they ought to be brought. And we've had some discussion of forum nonconvenience, uh, which I think is appropriate um, uh, area in which to have that kind of a discussion. So I'd like to talk specifically a little bit about the relationship between the alien tort statute and uh, forum nonconvenience. We've uh, heard a little bit about uh, a series of cases in which U.S. courts have dismissed um, lawsuits under the Alien Tort Statute on the basis of forum nonconvenience. And the holdings in those cases uh, are essentially that, look, you have a case, for example, there's a case against Coca-Cola uh, in which the plaintiff said that there was a group of uh, workers in Turkey. Uh, they claimed that they were involved in a labor dispute uh, at their Turkish bottling company. They claimed that they had been assaulted by the Turkish police at the direction of certain Coca-Cola entities, and then they then sued the Coca-Cola company as well as its subsidiary in the New York State Court. I, I'm sorry, in the New York Federal Court. Uh, Southern District Court in the Southern District of New York as well as the Second Circuit dismissed that lawsuit on the basis of foreign non-convenience doctrine, holding that, look, this is a case in which the plaintiffs are located in Turkey the subsidiary defendants in Turkey, the events happened in Turkey, the documents with respect to uh, Judith Chomsky were in Turkey, um, and uh, implicated here are acts of the Turkish police, uh, actions and inactions of the Turkish police, and so, as well as the witnesses located in Turkey. Um, and so, if we're gonna litigate this, where are we gonna litigate it? Where is it practical and convenient to litigate it? Court said, this case belongs in Turkey. Um, on the other, and there have been a series of decisions like that. Uh, on the other hand, arguments have been made by um, plaintiffs that perhaps form of convenience has no place or has a reduced place when we're talking about international law violations. And the argument, as I understand it, goes that, as we see, as the Second Circuit announced in WIWA, we as a nation have expressed as a policy that uh, we will provide a forum for violations of international law, whether committed here or committed abroad. And if, in fact, that is what we've done, and if, in fact, that is the policy that we have, then we ought to be providing a forum here for violations of those types of laws, and forum on convenience, therefore, ought to have some reduced applicability when we're talking about violations of international law. Uh, there is some tension there. I'd like to suggest, though, that perhaps the tension is not as great as it at first may seem, uh, both in light of some historical uh, uh, precedent, and I, I promise I'm not cherry-picking, or at least I'm trying not to, uh, and also in light of what I think are normative notions about what we mean by globalization and how we ought to be implementing that. Um, with respect to history, I, I think an important point, one that gets lost uh, often when we're talking about the Alien Tort Statute, is that the Alien Tort Statute was not passed with disregard of notions of convenience. In fact, the Alien Tort Statute was passed in significant measure because absent that statute, there would have been no convenient jurisdiction which to litigate the disputes at issue, which is to say that the Alien Tort Statute was enacted precisely to provide a convenient forum in the United States. Um, and so for example, just these two examples, one is um, discussed in SOSA <coughs> by the Supreme Court, uh, is the Marbois incident in which a French ambassador living in Philadelphia gets assaulted. The French government contacts the United States. I keep accidentally saying called the United States, but of course, this was 1781, I believe. So the French government contacts the United States and says, you have to provide some redress. We as a nation have been uh, suffered an affront by virtue of this assault against the French ambassador in Philadelphia. Um, well, one question before we go further in the story is, couldn't the French government have litigated that case in France? Could they have prosecuted that case in France? And the answer, of course, is no. The assault happened in Philadelphia, the ambassador was in Philadelphia, the assailant was in Philadelphia, the witnesses were in Philadelphia, and so on. 
And so France has essentially no choice. There is no convenient forum in France, and so they have to contact the United States. What's the response of the United States? Continental Congress says, well, I don't have any courts. Most I can do is call up the government, there I go with the call up, call up the government of Philadelphia or the, gov the government of the state of Pennsylvania and say to them, look, please pursue some relief as regards this French ambassador, um, which in fact happens, and I think it's actually of interest because we are now hearing a lot of discussion about, well, perhaps after Kiobo, plaintiffs are gonna move into state court. Uh, in fact, in this Marbois incident, what happened was that there was a lawsuit in the Pennsylvania state court and there was relief obtained there. Uh, but in any event, uh, after uh, the Congress was formed and after we began to have federal courts, a law was passed in which Congress said, look, I am here and after going to provide a venue in the United States for violations of international law. Now, right, and the, and the reason that I'm drawing this out is the point is, that law was passed not necessarily to provide jurisdiction for lawsuits in a case where the evidence was elsewhere. That, to the extent that was a response to Marbois, that was a situation in which Congress was saying, look, the evidence is here, but, but for action by Congress, there will be no convenient form in which to bring this litigation. Number two, relatedly, uh, as we've heard discussed, piracy was one of the acknowledged bases of international uh, law uh, in, in, the in the 18th century. Uh, and consider uh, an incident, I'm not certain whether this is hypothetical, but consider an incident in which a pirate operating off of the eastern seaboard but in international waters commits a violation as against the ship fly flying a British flag. Same situation, right? The British government ordinarily would want to bring that lawsuit, prosecute that pirate in Britain, but can't do that. Violation happened half the world away, can't reasonably bring those defendants into Britain, and so Britain has no choice but to demand of the United States provide some form for me because otherwise there will be no convenient form where I live. And again, the Alien Tort Statute has the effect of providing a form in that circumstance. And so I, 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 I sort of point to this history not uh, in order to argue that the Alien Tort Statute is legally limited in this way, not in order to argue that ATS has no extraterritorial jurisdiction or anything <coughs> of that nature, but merely to, to, to maybe draw the point that ATS is not by its nature inconsistent with notions of forum nonconvenience. In fact, I would argue the ATS by its nature emerges from concerns about uh, convenience. And, and I think that you know, sort of turning the clock forward 200 years or whatever it's been, um, and I'm getting a, a stop sign, but I'll, I'll just say two sentences. Turning the clock forward uh, 200 years to today, when we talk about globalization, we talk about uh, normative issues about how we think about globalization and how we implement globalization, um, I, I don't think it's crazy to suggest that if there's a violation of international law abroad, that ought to be litigated abroad. And I think that's consistent with uh, what we mean when we say the United States is not you know, an imperialist entity and the United States is one of however many hundred countries and we're going to respect the sovereignty of those countries and the right of those countries to implement uh, laws and to prosecute alleged violations within their borders. And so, so form non-convenience in this sense is a doctrine that says I'm going to defer and I'm going to act with comedy towards other sovereign nations. And maybe that is um, actually not inconsistent with international law, but, but completely consistent with international law in a, in a context of globalization. Thank you, Isaac. Um, so I, I want to open up the room for questions, but as, as the moderator, I get to ask the first one. Uh, I, I, I'd like everyone on the panel uh, to answer a normative question. I, I think we've been talking mostly about positive law. I, I want to go down the, the table and have everybody uh, give their answer to the, the normative question. Should U.S.-based corporations be legally accountable in U.S. courts for violations of international human rights law that occur in other countries? Should, it's, a, it's a should question. Sure. Should U.S.-based corporations be legally accountable in U.S. courts for violations of international human rights law that occur in other nations? Somebody want to? Well, it? clearly, I think they should. I and I and don't why? think it's a unique feature of human rights law. This is part of the transitory tort doctrine. They're here, they're operating here, they're subject to the jurisdiction of uh, U.S. <coughs> courts or state courts, 
and they bring the evil conduct with them to the United States. And actually, in many instances, the evil conduct originated in the United States. So it seems to me there's nothing unique about saying that the wrongdoer is subject to a tort claim where that wrongdoer resides. I guess what I'd say is the, the answer is yes to the extent the legal framework has been put into place as we know how to. You look at the, you, you look at the um, Anti-Terrorism Act, the ATA, you look at the FCPA, you look at certain federal criminal laws, you look at the implementation of the Genocide Convention, there would be ways to easily expand levels of corporate liability for violations of international law as the United States could choose to define them. And I don't, I, I think corporations should be legally responsible for the actions that they take and that the United States could make it clear what that rubric would be. But I think without the rubric being made clear, no, they shouldn't be. Uh, I would say yes for, for two reasons. First is that um, being a corporation uh, confers certain advantages. I mean, there are reasons that people organize corporations and when states recognize that corporations are going to get um, this status, they, get to have, they have certain um, limitations on liability. It's hard to get at shareholders and so forth. And so you get some pluses from that. So if we were going to be recognizing corporations and giving them these advantages in America, we should also be um, you know, demanding that they follow basic norms of, of, uh, of law. The second one is that, and this is something that shows up a lot in choice of law litigation domestically, is the idea that a, uh, a state or a nation has an interest in how it's perceived in other states or in other nations, and that if something that, if an entity that's based in your, in your country is acting and behaving abominably abroad, people who live in the rest of the world are going to judge your country based upon that. So we have, a, we have an interest, we have skin in the game if our companies are engaged in activity abroad that is really horrendous. If we don't do anything about that, if we, if we say, oh no, our courts are closed to them and as far as we're concerned they can run free with this, that's gonna be something that will be viewed in the rest of the world as this is a country that uh, doesn't hold itself to its own standards. They, they proclaim various great things and put up their statutes to themselves, but they don't actually you know, keep their, their entities from coming to, into our country and committing these sorts of things. And that, that affects the way we're viewed and, and perceived in a way that can really affect our foreign policy interests, our foreign po you know, a bunch of ways. I'd say yes, too, subject to a couple of points. The first is, uh, the question is whether co corporations should be held liable for international law violations in U.S. courts. A and there's, I guess, a prior question, which is whether international law, by its terms, uh, applies to corporations. To the extent that it does, uh, then, then, I would, then, an then I would agree that it ought to be extended uh, and applied in U.S. forms. To the extent that international law, per se, does not, even in does not, does not include um, does not extend to claims as against corporations, then obviously uh, it's difficult to say that a U.S. form should be provided in those circumstances. So that, that's the first. And the second is, look, should there be a cause of action in a U.S. court? Yes. But should the U.S. court exercise jurisdiction or should that lawsuit be resolved at the scene of the crime, so to speak, turning back to my comments on form nonconvenience, I think is an interesting normative question. I don't think it's obvious that um, we should be litigating those cases here. I, I, it seems to me that in the first instance, there ought to be a requirement that those claims, at least there's some showing that they, they could proceed in, or attempted to proceed in, in, the, in the location uh, where, where the event happened. And I do think that's starting to happen to a certain extent. I mean, you're seeing the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the Ecuador case in which there's a uh, multi-billion dollar judgment entered in an Ecuadorian court that the t tables have now turned, and we're now tr trying to argue, corporations now trying to argue that, in fact, the Ecuadorian court is not a good forum and it should all be litigated here. And so these things all get, you know, the tables uh, always turn around. Uh, but, but I do think it's an important prior question and a normative question as to where these things ought to get litigated. My answer would be yes. Clearly, international law is law of the United States. The pocket Habana said that back in 1900. Human rights law is no different. Um, U.S. courts have jurisdiction over crimes c 
international legal crimes based on the nationality of the perpetrator, and so, you know, that's not a problem. I think that <coughs> it is ideally preferable for violations committed abroad to be prosecuted abroad, that the host states have the ability to exercise their sovereignty and jurisdiction. I think there are a number of, of problems with that being actually implemented, including the, the relative strength of corporations versus the um, economic and political clout of host states, as Kent pointed out in his introductory remarks. The pressure, for instance, if you look at Bhopal, which was dismissed, the, the case involving the, um, the Union Carbide uh, spill, which is still killing people in India, there, the case was dismissed in the United States on foreign nonconvenience grounds, it went to India and the state, uh, the Indian government made a deal with the corporation that left uh, people, um, you know, in the lurch and no cleanup has a, as yet happened. So we have to take those realities into account when determining whether the, the in determining what the appropriate um, jurisdiction is. So uh, when, you ask, when you ask a question, just wait for the microphone. Uh, and let's, uh, hands up, uh, let's start here. That's right, uh, second, second row, second. Thank you, it's a very interesting um, discussion and um, I'm thinking about these issues. I'm at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government um, and used to do a lot of consumer work uh, in a former life as a legal aid attorney. And I have a question about framing this issue in terms of Ruggie's protect, respect, remedy framework and the recently adopted guiding principles. And I'd like you to answer that question with a couple things in mind. Number one, to what degree has the general conversation and tone changed because of the way in which there seems to be uh, corporations are realizing that there is at the very least PR value and perhaps you know, shareholder due diligence value in becoming more compliant with human rights norms. And then the second question is, what's really the role of the state? And I thought Paul's uh, comment about preemption in this US context is very interesting because in certain parts of the world, it seems like uh, one of the reasons that sort of bad things happen when corporations are acting there is largely because the state is not in a does not really have the capacity to effectively regulate. And where is really the role of the state to be kind of guiding and managing uh, that corporation's uh, uh, actions in that state? Thanks. This will get you started, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I think there are two answers. I think that, um, States are, pivotal, states are pivotal here because corporations are creatures of municipal law. So there's no getting around the fact that states are going to be incredibly important in pushing corporations to, to change normatively. An example of that that I think is very interesting and may point the way to where I think the future really is, is look at the English amendment, the UK uh, changes to their corporations law in 2001 where the where they redefined, although there have been no cases that I know of, which I think is interesting, but they redefined the nature of a director's fiduciary duty to include making sure that the corporation reasonably attains moral and social values that are worthwhile, hmm. which I have no idea what that means, but <laughs> it, I, I must say that is a real shift from what Milton Friedman would have said the corporate social responsibility of companies was, which is corporations are socially responsible for making money for their shareholders. So I, I think that what the English have done, I think points up the way, which is if you started to tell directors that the scope of their fiduciary duties included certain balancing of interests beyond the sole interest of the corporation, then corporate policies would change radically because directors are remarkably risk averse. And so I think that um, 
the creative use, well, I think that NGOs putting pressure on governments and putting pressure on companies with respect to issues of fiduciary duties, public nuisance laws, you know, all these things that impact how corporations interact with the public, um, I think that's probably, to me, where the pressure points are because I think that's where no director wants to see himself or herself on the front page as being accused of having violated their fiduciary duty, as being outside the realm of the law, and that's when companies begin to set up committees and start doing due diligence and start holding themselves to different standards. I'd like to uh, add something here, too. I think one of the, one of the great insights of, of Ruggie's work and the framework is, is, is it, it, he starts to use these corporate law tools, yeah. right? Using the, the UK uh, amendment as, as an example. Yeah. And if you ask directors to do their due diligence about the impact of their, their decisions on st multiple stakeholders, they start acting differently. The other, op the other corporate law option for dealing with this, and I speak to those of you who think of yourselves as a potential shareholder activist, is ultra virus doctrine. Ultra-virus doctrine is thought to be a dead area of the law, but there's still a vestige, which is that corporations are created to act lawfully, right? So it's in every U.S. Charter, uh, corporate charter that they are chartered to do any lawful act. So if a company is behaving uh, uh, illegally, then you could, you could uh, bring a shareholder suit to enjoin them to, to stop. Can I, can I uh, chip in sure. one other thing? Um, I think that one of the real issues is about whether or not uh, the PR is, uh, uh, ish, uh, angle of it is going to lead to better behavior or not is going to depend on whether there is meaningful policing. So right now, you routinely see companies that say, you know, we make this product in ways that are good for the environment and we have a very small carbon footprint in, in settings in which it's completely untrue. You see companies routinely say, you know, this product is made in America, so if you're patriotic, you know, buy this product. And in fact, the product is overwhelmingly made someplace else. Um, and you see a lot of companies saying, you know, we make this product without the use of sweatshop labor and so forth, and we're, we're a fine international actor. Now, there are currently in America a lot of fights about whether or not you can use consumer protection laws to go after sort of misleading advertisements on this. And there was a significant pushback now on the idea of commercial speech, where there is a movement right now of people who are essentially saying uh, commercial speech is such an incredibly important part of free speech. So, you know, when, when this country was formed, the thing that was most important to the framers was to make sure that corporations should be able to deceive people as long as there was some literal way of reading what they said that would not, be, would not constitute perjury if it was a perjury case kind of thing. And I've seen this kind of argument. It's put, there was a case in the Supreme Court, a Nike case, where there were literally like 40 briefs literally like 40 briefs on the Chamber of Commerce side, and the ACLU came in there, and uh, I quit my membership of the ACLU, have not given them a dissent since then, although I was, I was always probably the smallest contributor they ever had, but they, they are, there's a big f absolutist free speech argument saying, oh my gosh, how could you possibly say that Nike could ever be held liable for, you know, even if they deceive people, you know, you should only be allowed to sue someone if you can prove it under the very strictest standards of it. So if the commercial free speech absolutism takes hold, uh, Floyd Abrams is probably not in his room, but if his, if his approach to this ends up becoming the dominant one, then I think that the PR will be that, and will be entirely PR. It will be substanceless, because I think it will be very easy for companies to say things that sound good. We are a green company at the same time that they are doing all kinds of atrocities, and there's <coughs> not going to be any kind of meaningful limit. Only if the kinds of state laws that we have in America that say deceptive speech, misleading speech is actionable. You can go in and get something, you can get an injunction to stop it or you can get remedies against it. If, if you don't have any meaningful enforcement of it, then it's just going to become lip service and meaningless. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the foreign states somehow policing the conduct of foreign, co of multinational corporations. Going back to Shell, uh, in Shell was involved in a joint venture, essentially, with uh, the government of Nigeria, and that's true in Unical, and it's true for most extractive in, uh, industries, at least. So that polluting, uh, flaring the gas, making the environment unlivable for the people who live there, makes it cheaper to produce and increases the profits of both the corporation and the state. And therefore, there's no incentive to enforce it. And to the extent that 
some of the most extreme abuses are occurring not in Europe, not in North America, but in places where people don't know what's happening and the population has no way to resist what's happening, there's no realistic hope that the state, the foreign state, will protect its population, its citizens, from conduct that's paying them money. Isaac, did you want to get in? Yeah, just a, a quick comment. Th th there's, there's, I think there's, um, I, I agree with, with those who said that you know, this litigation, I think, has had significant um, impact uh, as a result of the PR attention and so forth. I, I would note, though, that um, there is, a, to a certain extent, a tension as between are we bringing lawsuits in order to affect, you know, global change versus to obtain uh, relief for the individual plaintiffs. Um, a corporation um, that is sued for, uh, tort for having committed torture or being complicit in torture um, is it much, much differently situated with respect to its ability to settle that case than a company that's accused of having been complicit in an ordinary tort. Even if at the end of the day the conduct was the same, if you know, the injury was the same, once you know, those labels start to get applied, it becomes much more difficult in a lot of cases for companies uh, to resolve those cases. Um, whereas you know, the, the torture label, I think, does make a significant difference in terms of PR. Uh, and so there's, I think, a tension as between are we doing, you know, is it relief for the individual versus relief, you know, globally? Yes, sir. I'm waiting for the mic. I was struggling with this uh, seminar up until Mr. Pell and Mr. Greenfield opened their mouths and started to talk the last couple of minutes. Um, I've been looking at supply chain issues in China. And, you know, one of the issues I look at is toxic workers, for example. I can't hear you very well. Just put, put Do I have it on? Okay, so one of the issues I've been looking at is, for example, workers exposed to anahexane who clean the Apple iPods. I'm not, I'm not a professional like you guys. Uh, I turn it over to you to speak for me. Um, so the workers get these neurological disorders because they clean these iPods that you buy for your kids and, you know, the, the stuff evaporates. But it doesn't seem to me that that's the kind of thing that would be cognizable or redressable under the Alien Tort Claims Act, yet Apple and for example, Walmart, my colleague here from the United Food and Commercial Workers is concerned about Walmart and he thinks about their supply chain. And Walmart says to their shareholders, we comply, or we make sure that our vendors comply in the forums where they do their manufacturing, right? So I'm intrigued by Mr. Pell's fiduciary duty argument because here's a company, Walmart, that says we're a good actor or Apple that says we're good for the environment and they have nice pictures with apples and so forth. And this ultra virus question, because what struck me about the ultra virus question is, is when you think about we'll be complying with the laws, we think about domestic laws. But really what's happening is, is these companies are going abroad, not necessarily because there are no laws or the laws don't exist. China has wage and hour laws, for example. But the companies have made a decision is, if I play ice hockey, so you know that if somebody's gonna you know, score a goal, you trip them, you're from Boston, you get that. Because it's only two minutes, you calculate the penalty, and it becomes part of the game, right? So where the country doesn't enforce compliance, then you say, well, you know, we just, we'll, we'll manufacture in China because it's not just that they don't have standards. They have standards, it's just that they're not enforced. So this idea of ultra virus, I'm just wondering, and I'd like your opinion, because it's interesting, can you say that that means that a company is acting ultra virus when it's knowingly manufacturing a product in violation of the laws of the place where they're doing the manufacturing. And if, in fact, Mr. Pell, and it's always nice to ask these questions to a, a corporate lawyer, right? Um, if, in fact, you have a company like Apple whose brand and reputation, or Walmart, for example, is based on being a good citizen, right? Depending on what representations the company makes, right? Are they then stepping over the line where they're sacrificing the brand and reputation such that, that there is potentially, and I love to get my ideas from people who defend these companies, which I appreciate that, uh, potentially an action for breach of fiduciary duty. So first, either breach of fiduciary duty and this ultra virus question, because I just find that phenomenally intriguing, because it sort of hits areas that aren't addressable under the Alien Tort Claims Act and some of the other things we've been talking about. So, so on the ultra virus thing, 
I think you're right that the, the magic of the ultra virus doctrine is that it will flow wherever the corporation flows. Uh, and and not, not to self-cite, but I wrote an article in the Virginia <laughs> Law Review about, about, about 10 years ago that sets this out in, pretty in, in excruciating detail. You were supposed to say seminal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're supposed Brown to say Brown seminal. Brown. Sorry. Uh, 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 so, so, and we can talk at, afterwards, but, but the short answer is yes. Well, and I, I, think the, I think the question points up what I think is an important, what, what I was trying to get to in my introductory remarks, which is that I think that you can't, human rights law per se cannot carry all the water here. You, you really have to start looking at other frameworks that are much more capable of focusing in on very specific problems. So for example, minor tweaks to fiduciary duty law could have massive repercussions in the way corporations respond to human rights challenges. Um, another example would be dis like the Dodd-Frank disclosure rules as to conflict minerals. Right, the Dodd-Frank, Dodd I think it's what, 1541, you know, buried in the 1500 pages of the act is this one paragraph that, that goes to companies that use a group of seven minerals of which you need at least half a gram in every cell phone in Blackberry. And it, it creates reporting obligations. The creation of reporting obligations in and of itself has the capacity to change behavior because it shines a light on something that otherwise might not have a light shined on it. I think the trade laws, because there are there is room in you know in, in the GATT rubric and the WTO rubric for regulating products for certain reasons that don't have to do just with price and tariff. And it may be that certain areas of public policy may be places that, that countries can start pushing back. Uh, public nuisance laws, ultra virus laws. I think that there are ways, valid ways, because of stream of commerce arguments where corporations may face completely new challenges because they won't be getting sued under the ATS. I mean, it, it's sort of, you gotta be careful what you wish for. You don't like ATS cases, fine. You get so, so you start winning those ATS cases, they all get dismissed. Well, the plaintiff's bar is neither stupid nor do they sleep at night. They figure out a different way. And there's no question that there are other legal frameworks you could pursue that would frankly be much more risky for corporations than what they used to face under the ATS. Let's go back to this side of the room. Yeah. This is why the they need the, me. All the, all the way in the back, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I had a question for all the panelists. Um, basically, it seems to me that one of the most successful defense moves uh, in a lot of these ATS cases has been to um, import criminal procedures and criminal um, norms into, this, into these tort cases. And um, the, the, the argument essentially is if I couldn't be dragged into the, the ICC or if you couldn't get me at one of these criminal, criminal tribunals, then there shouldn't be any liability to me under tort. And I guess my, my question, it seems bizarre to me that, that we would use criminal, all these criminal procedures and rules in a tort case. And so I guess my, my question is really, where, how did we get there? And is there any way out of, of that path that we've taken? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I'd start by saying Kiobel decided there is no corporate liability. The 11th Circuit thinks there is. So we shouldn't think that Kiobel is the world of uh, ATS litigation. I think Cabrinus made several mistakes in using, in saying when we look to international law, all we look to is criminal tribunals. I mean, it's clear at Nuremberg there was no criminal tribunal to look to. Nuremberg talked about the fact that it was drawing from customary international law, not international criminal law. Cabrinus was incorrect in saying that there was no punishment for the corporations because Nuremberg, in fact, before Nuremberg, before the, uh, the authority set up the Nuremberg tribunals, they also dissolved <coughs> Farben because Farben had engaged in aggressive waging war 
which was an international law violation. Again, something Cabranus missed. The framers, or the, uh, the, those who wrote the ATS, couldn't have meant that you look to international tribunals because no such thing existed. And Sosa recognizes that what, the what was done with the ATS was to take customary international law and say, we're going to use US tort law to implement it. And US tort law recognizes the, the liability of corporations for their acts. And there's nothing in the ATS or ATS history that suggests that they're exempt or that the place to look is international criminal law. That was a creation of Cabrinus with no foundation in any other decision. Well, yeah, to um, follow up on that, the distinction in international law uh, be between international legal persons and non-international legal persons. Um, since uh, the era of positivism has been between state and non-state actors, not between corporations and individuals. Corporate, the, the question of whether corporations are subjects of international law goes to whether corporations are state actors or non-state actors. So one way that the, this whole criminal analogies came about is because people said, look, this is not a correct history of international law. International law has always involved non-state actors. Look at the issue of piracy. Look at the issue of slave trading. These were crimes under international law that were committed by individuals and were, were, were prosecuted as international legal crimes. So therefore, international law has not only acknowledged states as actors. Um, the, the other mistake in Kiobel had to do with this question. The judge said, used a quote from Nuremberg and said um, something to the effect of um, crimes are committed by people, not abstract entities. What he was referring to was not corporations versus individuals. He was referring to states. In other words, the, the argument was whether the question was whether individuals could be prosecuted for the crimes committed by states. That was the context. So he took that quote out of context and said, therefore, corporations are not li liable under international law. There are a lot of mistakes like that in the decision and a lot of um, unnecessary, I think, um, um, interplay or um, conflating of criminal and, and tort law. I, I actually think that Judge Cabranes was pretty clear that international, he, I think he correctly stated international judicial decisions are not by themselves international law. And I think he makes, he's made that clear not only in Kiabel but in, in Flores and in Yusuf. <coughs> Um, I think he does understand the role of international judicial decisions, but he makes very clear they are not in and of themselves necessarily statements of binding international law. I think with regard, I do disagree. I think there has been a real split in international law, not only between the tension between what is a state actor versus what is a non-state actor, but there has certainly been, especially since World War II, a real debate in international law about corporations as juridical persons and what rights and they do have and what rights and responsibilities they don't have. And there is a tremendous lack of unanimity in that because it has economic ramifications that states don't yet agree on. I think the last thing that's worth noting is that the allies, and it was really the Western allies without the Russians, did indeed dissolve Farben before the Nuremberg Charter was made. What is interesting is they had the option at Nuremberg of prosecuting Dresdner Bank and Krupp 
as corporations and decided they didn't really have the ability to do it. And instead, they only went after the individual executives. And it's a very powerful thing to read the ministry's case where, in fact, three U.S. judges who were serving as judges of the CEO of Dresdner find that just because he knew how the bank's money was going to be used by the German government, he actually wasn't guilty of aiding and abetting war crimes. He was, aiding and, he was found guilty of other things, but interestingly, he got off aiding and abetting even though it was taken for granted that he and the bank knew exactly what its money was being used for. So I really think that Cabrinus is on to something in Kiabel, and what he's on to that goes to your question is that the alien tort statute is a really badly worded statute. And it was written at a time when international law was extremely limited and the role of corporations in society was extremely limited. If the alien tort statute is to be adapted to the modern age, it's going to have to be amended. But that, and, that's, and that's really the point I think that is important to make, which is that SOSA says that the alien tort statute extends to international law violations only to the extent that they are universally accepted. And so it may be that the correct answer is that corporations are liable under international law. But to the extent that there is debate about that issue in international law, it's outside of what's covered by the alien tort statute, even if the majority opinion is that it is a part of international law. I think that's a significant issue. Um, the US law, the ATS doesn't extend, it's not the majority opinion. It has to be universally accepted. With apologies to those of you who still have questions, it's 4 p.m. And, and LaShawn, we, we, we have five more minutes. So we have time for one more, one more question, please. This gentleman here. Uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I have the same question about ATS. Uh, under SOSA, the Supreme Court held that ATS is, is to be construed as a pure jurisdictional statute. And I, um, from that statement, I believe ATS as a jurisdictional statute is totally irrelevant and uh, redundant because uh, let's look at the 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 Cuba case. In the second circuit it says, um, under international law, corporations, ca uh, federal court cannot assert jurisdiction over corporation under international law, but under U.S. domestic law, state court and federal court can assert ju personal jurisdiction over corporations so long as they satisfy uh, minimum contact. So to me, uh, the question is, why couldn't a state court and U.S. federal court entertain? substantive international law violations claims uh, against corporations independent of ATS by merely invoking uh, personal jurisdiction because in SOSA, the Supreme Court made it very clear that the United States incorporate international law as part of its common law. So to me, we don't have to invoke international law. It's part of the domestic US law. I, I, I mean, I, I think that partly that's exactly what, what, what was done in the UNICAL case in the st on the state court level. But I think, remember, yeah. I think you only draw, you only look to international law for a rule of decision where U.S. law does not, where U.S. common law does not otherwise provide it. It's not automatic that you incorporate all of international law into U.S. common law. You only look to it under pocket Havana. It's only when you've looked and there's no other federal common law to look to. That's why they looked international law in that case um, with regard to an admiralty case. But I think that it is fair to say that under certain circumstances, in state court, you could, if there was a gap in the common law, a state court could look to international law with respect to something as to which, which was otherwise within its jurisdiction. Uh, the UNICAL state case and the, it's based, I mean, torture is also a tort of battery, battery or right. summary execution is wrongful death. Mm -hmm. So that we didn't have to use international norms to bring the state law claims. We have Ray, uh, brought suits along with the ATS claims under 1331, but so far no court has ever paid attention to that part. So we did try that, but it, it didn't even get discussed. So, so immediately after this session, uh, there will be remarks by Congresswoman Donna Edwards at 5 p.m. in the presidential ballroom. Then the day will conclude with our favorite part of the day, a reception, um, in the congressional and senate rooms at 6 p.m. All right, so thanks for your attention. Thank you for the panel, excellent panel.